so we're sitting at Kosher Fest today and I'm having a chat to Andrew from Rackersons in the UK. And uh, Andrew, welcome and thank you for coming on to our show. So what we're finding is that we're, we're having some interesting discussions around companies that are growing in these sort of times that we're are perceived as being economically challenging times and times when the world is at war, etc. Are you seeing similar growth in, in your business? I'm seeing some growth in the business, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's been driven by two things, really. Some inflation, because right. we've to put our prices up. Right. And then some growth on the back of the, the nature of the products that we sell, because right. they're vegan, dairy-free, nut-free, as well as kosher. Right. So, so there's a sort of uh, there's a lot of um, dynamic for people wanting to cut out certain things like meat, etc. Of course. More healthy. Of course. Okay. So we're actually seeing a knock-on effect of the uh, political drive towards reducing meat, etc. On businesses like yours. Yeah, political drive, but also people, yeah. you know, well, believe in health. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, sustainability yeah, as well. Exactly. And yeah. um, so I think it's a number of things that are driving that. But also we have simple products in terms of the recipes. Consumers have also recognized that if you can't understand something that's written on the packaging, right. why would we eat it? There's good, so of therefore, course. there's a whole discussion going on about the, the nature of the product, the ingredients that are used, right. and you know, do people feel comfortable eating something that they, can, they can't understand? Yeah? Of course, of course. So this is a, a warehousing show yeah. and what the warehouse, and what we're, quite interested in is the supply chain challenges yeah. that you have. Now, it's interesting that you talk about reduced ingredients. Would you say that that makes the whole inbound manufacturing process and supply chain process simpler? In, in, in theory, it does. But I think yeah. if you look at our, our business, we've always had the similar, our products are pretty similar and have been for a few years. So right. if you look at, to answer your question about the supply chain, we're finding that lead times are going out. Okay. Because, you know, there is instability in terms of uh, so people want longer lead time, so we're having to carry more basic ingredients, basic right. packaging. So there's obviously a cost of, there's a capital of implication of that. There's a warehousing implication of that, so where do we sure. store all this stuff? Of course. And then, uh, so, so from a manufacturing inbound perspective, right. uh, all of our lead times have gone out. Okay. Uh, and quite considerably, so we, we, we see examples of the, the take packaging as an example, the, the printed cartons we use. Uh, three years ago, we would be, and this is before COVID and before the war, uh, we would say four weeks. Now we're on 16 weeks. Wow. So and then the, the other implication from a, from a warehouse is a forecasting perspective. You have to plan for this. Yeah. Uh, where are you importing predominantly from? The file packaging, most of it's made and manufactured in the UK. Okay. But of course, cardboard is imported. Sure. So, that, you know, it's, it's Scandinavia, um, some from, you know, the ex Russian, you know, the Russians not used it. Right. Yet. Our ingredients, we have two types of products. We have a wheat-based product, so right. our wheat comes from a flour mill 30 miles from, the, from our factory, okay. and the grain's all from the north of England. Right. But we also do gluten-free. Right. Gluten-free uses things like maize starch, so that's a, an imported raw material, mm -hmm. some from North America, some from Asia. So you've got different, so different products have different uh, supply chains, okay. and the, the gluten-free side is more complicated because most of the ingredients we have to import. Right, right, right. And uh, your product range, I mean, you, you're exporting all over the world. Is, yeah. So where's your biggest market? Still in the UK? Our, UK's our largest market. Right. Uh, our second largest market is the United States. Okay. Probably about 10% of our sales, not big enough, but we'd like to grow it. We've right. also got business in South Africa. Okay. And that's doing okay. And we've also got some business in Asia. Uh, okay, that's an interesting uh, market. Yeah, and there's some opportunities there as well that we're, we're, look, we're discussing now. Right. Um, so, yeah, we, we're always looking to grow the business. Of course. For opportunities. And yeah. I think it goes back to the first question you asked me, the nature of the products mm. gives mm. us the opportunity. I understand, I understand. Tell me the warehousing operations in the U.S. when you're importing, uh, are you finding that you have challenges with um, with shipments over here, delays and um, supply chain challenges coming? Anything going import? outside the U.K. on a container, yeah. there's two things have happened in the last uh, two and a half, three years. Yeah. Prices have gone up dramatically Right. and lead times have gone yeah. out again. Yeah. So if you look at the United States, we used to, I won't give you a number, but our container costs have gone up fourfold. Yeah. And 
our lead times, we used to be able to turn it around in, you know, we get a container within seven days. Now we're talking yeah. 21 to 28 days. Yeah. So it's, it's once again, it's about the planning. forecasting and planning. Yeah, and, and it's making sure that you get it done in time. Yeah. And then specifically for us, we need food grade containers. So we're in a sort of, of subsection of, of, course. of the bigger ponds. So yeah, speak, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And um, the, the take up in the market, are we seeing growth in the market in the US? Small growth, yeah. I mean, okay. I think um, as we saw a few markets, it's they're now coming out of the COVID situation. Right. Consumers are starting to sort of, you know, get back to some more normal shopping behaviour. Yes. But there is a challenge with inflation, so you, you've got this double. Yeah. So our growth is really coming from the nature of the products because of the vegan and, and you know the dairy yeah. health, healthy nature, and also kosher, of course. Sure. But. Um, but we've got inflation, so we've got a, it's a bit of a headwind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the nature, and consumers changing behavior that's helping us. Right, right, right. What do you think the biggest challenges are for you in the supply chain here in the States, as opposed to in the UK? First, you're getting the product here. Right. And then, and the cost therein. Mm -hmm. And then shipping within the United States now has become also a lot more expensive. Right, and right. And there is some, so, and lead times are longer. Yeah. So you've got, it's, 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 it's really, it's lead time and cost. Of course. And planning for that. Do your products have um, best before and expiry uh, yes. date? And have you had to do anything to expand those or in no. increase that? No. We have 12 months from production. Okay. And that's it's still nice. challenging when, you know, you, you've got a, a, a two month in your yeah. supply chain. It and is, but then, but I mean, the reality is that it gets into the store with about seven or eight months shelf. Right. So okay. Consumer, yeah, you're still okay. So if it's not selling through at a rate where that yeah. doesn't work, then... Yeah. We shouldn't um, be there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Okay. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, the market here is is fascinating. You know, uh, you could just see by Kosher Fest yeah. the the number of people and the excitement in the food industry. Uh, we, we had a stat that there's something like twelve thousand food operations in the tri-state area. It's just insane. I mean, I yeah. I mean it's true in most countries. It's funny enough is if you look at it in other, the United States, but also in Europe and also in Asia, there's a lot. The growth in smaller startups where people yeah. are recognizing that the consumers uh, a have a slightly different need secondarily they are um, looking for choice yes yes, I yes. Mean, it's, if you go back it's almost like go back to think about the car industry 40 years ago you've got a car one color and one spec right now there's a there's a million versions of the same car <laughs> and, and consumers want that I, I always question whether consumers actually want that or not. You know, for me, I want simplicity. I, I want to buy a cheese product, for example. Don't give me 50 cheeses. I just want the one I want. Everybody needs <laughs> to their own. Uh, no. say, Tell yeah. me, do you, are you seeing a westernization in the Asian market where they, they're going more for uh, their non-traditional products? So as a result, growth? I think that Asia's interesting because it's, they are buying non-traditional products. Yeah. But there's a, there's a, it has to relate to their diet. Right. I mean, I, I have before I worked in this in the cracker business, I worked in the dairy industry, and there is no, no natural dairy market in China and Japan, for example. I didn't know it, that. They don't. They just they're buying dairy progressively on things like yeah. cheese on burgers, but the consumption level is dramatically lower than Western Europe and North America. Right. 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 So right. therefore, what we're finding with our crackers is that. You might find in the UK or the United States that people would use them for dipping or putting cheese on. The Chinese are actually doing, they're eating them, but in a different way. Right, right, right. So so we have a, we have an opportunity because they like crackers. Yeah. But if you're selling, you know, blue cheese in China, you've got really no chance. It's very difficult. Okay, okay. Because they don't have any habit of eating it and they don't sure, like it. Sure, sure. One of the things I found fascinating was the wine industry in the East, is, especially in places like Japan, yeah. in, for kosher wine, is really, really booming. And one of the reasons is because kosher wine is boiled and they perceive that as being better. more uh, yeah, uh, cleaner or better. Yeah, really interesting market. Yeah. yeah but, I mean, I, I mean but it, Japan, China, and these places, is, each market has its own characteristics. Sure. Uh, sure. And, and the opportunities need to be tailored. Yeah. But if you're starting with a base product as we are, which is something that they, you know, everyone eats crackers. Of course. Yeah. Of course. The question then is, what type of cracker do they want? How do you how do you present it to them? Right. And and how and what how are they going to eat it? Yeah. Once you've yeah. worked all that out, there's an opportunity. Of course. Of course. And there's a trust as well from, in our case, for products manufactured in the UK. In, right. In, right. Um, food standards and all the rest. Yeah. Of yeah. And and you you. 
Only manufacturer in the UK, you know? Moment, yes. Right, right. We have a site in Leeds. Um, yeah. Been there since 1900. Amazing. On that site. Yeah. This is the third site since 1900. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it's, it's fantastic to have an established company like yourselves out of the UK, you know, opening up this market in, in the States. And as you say, 10% of your volume. Yeah, um, hopefully more, hopefully yeah. growing. Yeah, no, <laughs> listen, this market, uh, you know, we're all, we're all sitting here because this market is where it's at. At the end of the day, um, there's growth, there's excitement, there's opportunity. Yeah. yeah. It's been fantastic. Um, okay. Andrew, thank you very much for thank coming you. on and I appreciate the chat. All right. Yeah, thank brilliant. you very much for having me. No, brilliant stuff. Thank you.